Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 157 for Monday, March 19th, 2018. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast booking musicians here at GigGabPodcast.com. Sponsors for this episode include TuneLicensing.com, T-U-N-E Licensing.com, where coupon code GigGab2018, easy for me to say, saves you 15%, <laughs> 15 off of licensing fees. We'll talk more about how that all works in a moment here in Durham, New Hampshire, back in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. Welcome back, Dave. Thanks, man. And uh, thanks, everybody, for your patience last week. We um, we really tried to get an episode recorded before I left for South by Southwest. And then uh, our respective schedules, including a crazy snowstorm here. And us. I think you had some travel or something on your end at the beginning of the week. So I don't know. The, the stars were aligned against the us. The fates. Yeah, yeah, the fates kept us apart. It, they did. Yep. So, uh, but I have lots of That's the first about. one. That's the in first one we missed in three years. It, is that right? Is that the first? I know we've. I don't think we've ever not posted one. And I, I was possible. feeling yeah. quite a bit of remorse. Yeah, me too. It was. Yeah. Yeah. That's just kind of how it went. And then I lost my voice. Austin allergies last week for anybody that lives or lived in Austin last week was a really bad week for people visiting. Like it generally isn't an issue, but Austin is like the allergy capital of the world. And it's um, it can be rough. So anyway, it was rough. I, I had no voice up until like midday yesterday, starting about uh, I think Thursday. Um, I just I just it went, it went away. It was it gone? Got nothing. Weird. Yeah. It just sucked. Good thing you didn't have a gig. It's a good thing. I saw a lot of gigs, though. So that was good. Yeah. So why don't we back up here? Why don't you tell everybody what South by Southwest is? Because people may think they know, but uh, really, you know, it's a unique beast in the world. So it is. why don't you tell everybody what it is? Yeah. So, I, yeah, I guess we didn't really go into this when we talked about it at the last show. All right. During the last episode. So South by Southwest, officially the South by Southwest Fest Conference and Festivals um, is like a 10 day event and if you look on the like if you if you go to answer that question, you will see that it has three festivals, an interactive festival, a film festival and a music festival. But a little bit of digging reveals that it's really actually five. There's an education festival and a gaming festival that happen sort of throughout this. And it it started in Austin. I'm pretty sure it started as a music festival. That's right. Uh, yep. And then uh, and then they added film to it and then they added interactive. And then these other things are, are sort of growing as part of it. And um, it it it's like that's the right way to describe it. Um, but what. OK, so what does that mean? Well, there's one section of the week, the end of the week, which is, you know, has bands playing all the time. Um, starting the week is is what they call their interactive festival, which is, um, a, you know, it, like a, to the outside world and even to the inside world. It's a technology conference. Um, and some th interesting things have happened there over the years. That's uh, of the big three. That's the newest part of it. But um, I think that's where Twitter really got their their start years and years ago there. Um, and and I think that actually hurt the interactive festival for a little while because there were a couple of things like that that happened at South by Southwest. And it became it, the expectation, right, that, that the interactive festival was going to be this big deal every year. And sometimes it was. And like things happen, sometimes it wasn't, you know, because you can't plan for those sorts of things. And and I think that expectation actually hurt them. You know, there, there's a lot of uh, commentary that it, it became a... Um, like a, an echo chamber, which is how all conferences are. That's well, what they should you know, let me be. just pause you there because that's my world, right? So that's what they you should know. be, right? <laughs> well, no, let me just say this. Yeah. So for those who don't know, my background is being a, a conference and trade show manager. That's what mm -hmm. I've done for many, many years. And that's the 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 that's vehicle by which Dave and I actually met. That's my thing. And so, yeah. you know, if you work a day job, your company or you probably participate in some kind of a trade show somewhere, you know, conference somewhere. Yep. And, uh, you know, this thing about South by, which is one of the most interesting animals in the world in the, in that, in that business, because, 
um, it does have so many arms and legs. It's totally transformed a city's economic makeup. You know, the, the number of people who come into Austin for this is dramatic and has a, has a large effect on the town's revenue. Yeah. Um, but that whole thing about an echo chamber, here's the deal. When something's really successful, I guess you can map this out to anything. Sure. When something's really successful, it's, it's, uh, it's a prime target for criticisms of uh, r- real and imagined. And imagined. Fair? That's right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That, I guess the point I was trying to make is that to me, the, the comment that it's an echo chamber it actually isn't a criticism at all. To me, that's, that's how all conferences are. Like it's what it's supposed to be in a, in a sense yep. is you're bringing people together that have a common interest that don't necessarily get to interact with each other elsewhere. So like to me, that's a good thing. That's kind of what it's supposed to be. So, yeah. Well, and, but sometimes people, sometimes people will say the, the levy that criticism that it's, it's, the same Absolutely. choir talking to itself. And yes. so it can be framed as a criticism, but remember, you know, all big trade shows and conventions, they go through these cycles of, you know, let's say E3, for example, E3 oh, yeah. is a huge convention uh, that is for the gaming industry. And there are years when just not that interesting games get released, yep. you know, whether it's software or hardware and, you know, you'll, you'll hear the, Oh, that show is done, you know, but there are cycles there, are, there are market cycles totally. and the events are just kind of reflections of that. South by is actually one of the most interesting events in the world. I think I agree. And it's interesting because, yeah, well, you know, it's origins as a music festival that started to take on reflect its local culture. You know, there's a, there has been for, you know, a couple of decades now, a growing technology sector in Austin. Totally. Uh, and so, you know, that became married and, you know, remember the origins of South by were that it was a local, you know, a local newspaper. Do, do you have anything in your area? Like, you know, the village voice would be in New York city right. out here in, in Silicon Valley. We have the Metro newspaper, which is kind of like the alternative newspaper, right? It's not the big corporate you know, newspaper. It's kind of the ones that has kind of more of the local advertising, you know, uh, sometimes kind of questionable advertising, you know, the, the types of products that advertise there, um, you know, more kind of commentary on local politics, those types of things. Do you have, do you have something like that in your town or is your town not big enough for that? Uh, I, ta- I, doesn't have one, but San Jose, the, 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 the Bay area has one. Yeah, the, Portsmouth, Valley. Portsmouth has, there's like a seacoast thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Got it. Yep. So, you know, that was the origin. That team was the origin of it what the Austin became Chronicle. Southwest. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And um, and here's what I want to say that's relative to our audience here is that um, I have experienced every town in the country wants a South by Southwest. Every city in the country wants to have that kind of a you know, renaissance, um, again, yep. revenue affecting um, tourism, uh, uh, you know, uh, industry defining landmark event. Yep. Some cities are better laid out for it than others. Austin happens to be fantastically laid out it's, for oh, it. It's, right it's, size city, yeah. the number of music venues in close proximity. I mean, yep. there's so many reasons why Austin is serendipitously the most amazing city in the world to have that event. Oh, it, but it's, there are few, there are others where this can, can be done. And some of them happen like the Reeperbahn festival over in Germany yep. and stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's not every city is built to, for, for the, like you said, it's serendipity. <laughs> it's really what it is. Yeah. 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 But my point is, is that, you know, I I wonder for our listeners out there, is your town trying to do something like this, a citywide local music and arts festival? Yeah. And is that, you know, is that a good showcase for you? So so South by is a little bit different. It's not really a local music festival. It's really a very much national, international music festival. You saw some really big acts there, right? Yeah. But it, and it, uh, to that point about it being a local festival, it's interesting when I lived in Austin, especially in the, you know, late nineties, South by Southwest, the music part, had been around for 10 years. Uh, you know, it was like, it was a thing. And a lot of Austin, the, the general consensus throughout Austin, just amongst the locals, not even musicians is avoid South by Southwest, avoid downtown, like the plague that week. And, um, and only because of the hassle factor, not because they have any animosity towards South by it's more like traffic is more than it ever is. And the restaurants are fuller than they ever are. Right. No, it's the animosity toward it. I was just going to say like South by Southwest by, by a lot of local musicians is called South by. So what? 
And mm. and there really is some animosity toward it by by some, not n- not by all. In fact, a lot of local musicians embrace it and say, wow, it's this great thing that's right here. You know, that's cool. Uh, but but yeah. And the whole traffic thing, like it, it, I, even at the worst of what I saw this week and I drove in and out half the time, I stayed downtown for the music part, but I, I stayed with a friend for the first half and like, the traffic was never even as bad as like Manhattan on the lightest Saturday afternoon that I've ever seen. <laughs> it's just, it, but this is a thing about Austin is they overblow their traffic. Like even when I lived there 20 plus years ago, it, they just, they overblow their traffic. So don't believe all that negative hype. It's, it's really fun. And if you live in Austin, I highly recommend you go to this thing. If you don't live in Austin, it really is a great time to go and experience Austin. All of Austin as a tourist sort of compressed into a few days, right? Because Austin's yeah. not really a tourist town. It's it's a town where people just live. And so it's it can be music tough. tourism, right? Well, even that, I mean, like, yeah, kind of, but it's sort of spread out and it's it's a town to live in, not a town to just visit. Um, and so it can Is be Is there t- like a Wait, wait, wait. Is there like a Stevie Ray Vaughan pilgrimage process if you go to Austin? Well, yeah, there's the, the statue on Town Lake. But you know, other than that, you know, that's that's it pretty much. That's it? Uh, yeah, that's it. You go mm. see the statue and then you walk back across the, the bridge and get some good food <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. So anyway, it, it like South by Southwest is a great week to 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 be there. And I, I did. I saw some uh, I saw quite a few bands, not as much as I usually have. I. I, like I said, I wasn't feeling all that well, although that didn't really slow me down a whole lot. I had another, I had some other stuff going on that I, that took me out of town for a day and, and things like that. But, um, but it was, it, it, um, you know, I, so the big bands, there weren't as many big names at South by Southwest this year as there have been in the past. Uh, but the, the names that, that might resonate here are, uh, I saw the Preservation Hall jazz band play. I saw Todd Rundgren play and I saw Keith Urban play. That's pretty big names. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the interesting thing was, so, uh, let's see, Preservation Hall jazz band show was packed. Uh, I was lucky that I got like an express pass, like cut the line pass essentially for that one. There's, there's different ways you can go about doing South by Southwest. And, and if you have a badge, you can sign up for these express passes so that you can cut the line and get into clubs. And, and so I did that for most of these bands because I, you, I just plan ahead. Um, and, uh, and it worked out well, but yeah, the preservation hall jazz band, that's, it's interesting to that band, um, I've seen them in New Orleans. I've been to Preservation Hall. You go, you sit on the floor or whatever, and you you listen to the band play, and they just play in the room. And when I saw that in New Orleans, it was very much like Dixieland jazz and and that kind of thing. Their touring outfit has changed dramatically, and they are now like a samba salsa band that's mm. just cooking and playing grooves. It's almost it's almost like seeing a Latin version of Parliament Funkadelic on stage. It's just like an extended party. They do. I mean, the songs. Well, that's what that's what Trombone Shorty was like, was just like. (laughs) Right. Amazing. Downbeat to encore, you know, just a party on stage. It's just a party on stage. Demands you participate. You must participate. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And so that's what it was. I think there were, you know, four four horn players and then guitar, uh, upright bass, uh, not guitar, uh, upright bass, drums and keys. Um, and then, and then there was a, you know, a trombone player, a trumpet player and two sax players. And it, it was, it was just that party vibe all the way through and great grooves. I mean, these grooves were just so the drummer and bass be. player made it look so easy. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I really hated those guys. Um, and then I saw Rundgren. So that one was also pre-announced that, that he was going to be there. And it was a 1am showcase at a, you know, average size club. It, I don't think it was like I walked in maybe uh, less than an hour before he played, you know, there was another band playing or whatever and it wasn't full, you you know, and Todd was just kind of hanging out in the club. Do you know Todd Rundgren, 
Paul, did you ever meet him? Because met him of I met him once. Yeah. No, I actually met him at an EG conference, oh, another industry conference. Okay. And we talked about Macworld Expo, but he has a long connection that predates me, actually. To Macworld okay. Expo. Yeah, that was I never met him because of Macworld that predate predated me, too. Yeah. So we have some mutual friends that are very good friends of his. Um, but uh, but anyway, so, you know, I, I saw him play. I've seen him before. He's an avant garde performer. If you've never seen Rundgren you probably, unless you're a big fan and you know what to expect, you'll you'll likely be surprised by him. He's it's, he's actually a lot like Van Morrison. Is that he, he, he will play whatever the heck he wants to play? Correct. And he's and every he, tour seems to be different. Every tour is different, right? And he was on stage. Uh, you know, he's. I mean, he's a huge dude. He's like my height and just this big hulking kind of guy. Yep. But but very flamboyant on stage at times. It's almost like you know. I think some people said that David Bowie stole a lot from him or borrowed a lot from him. In, was inspired by him. And I can. Mm. I I oh after seeing him perform, you know, for sure. This was the most rock show of his that I've ever seen. And he had. I had forgotten until I walked in. He had, you know, he toured with the new cars about, he was the singer for that thing when Rick Ocasek didn't tour with yep. the cars 10 years ago. And they called it the new cars. And the drummer on that tour was Prairie Prince from the tubes. And that's who he has in his band now. Oh, um, heavy hitter. His keyboard player was Greg Hawks, who was both that cars, you know, keyboardist, yep. and also the original cars keyboardist. And there were two other guys, a bass player and another guitar player that, I mean, they were, you know, stellar cats, as you would expect, like he would hire, he wouldn't hire slouches. And it was a rock show, you know, like, it, I mean, he played a lot of his hits and stuff, but it was a, you know, it wasn't, it didn't go off in like weird directions, at least not from, from that standpoint. And, uh, and then as an encore, which was weird, like most bands don't wind up doing encores at, at South by Southwest because you're just playing in clubs and, and the bar has closing time, even if you're the last act or whatever. But the crowd uh, demanded an encore and Todd came out. The band had already gone onto the bus. And so he dragged them back on stage on the bus. Yeah. <laughs> how did you how could you tell? Because I saw the door behind the stage open and the bus was out there and he dragged the band in from out there. Yeah. They like they had taken their ears off and all, everything like it, they had to they had to sort of scramble to get back on stage. But he said, uh, you know, one of the guys in the band has an anniversary of sorts this year. So we'll play this. And they played Good Times Roll from the cars, which was which was mm. fun. Yeah, it was good. Um, it's cool. Yeah. And uh, and then Keith Urban. It was really weird. So he played at Stubbs, which is the big outdoor venue of South or one of the two big outdoor venues of South by Southwest. It holds maybe, I think, 2000 people max, you know, so it's it's big, certainly big for South by Southwest when most venues are, you know, a couple hundred people. But, yeah. you know, but small compared to your arenas and, and of course, stadiums and all that. Uh, and he was the headliner on Friday night there. And the place was maybe half full. Um, it was not packed. There was not a line out the door and, uh, and he came on stage and, and kind of mentioned, you know, as he walked on stage, he looked at the band and, you know, you could tell something wasn't quite right. And he said, well, it's Friday night. It'll be loose. And that's what he said to the guys. And then they, they launched into their set. And I realized there was no bass player on stage, even though we were oh. hearing a bass player. Yeah. And it was just weird. Uh, it turns out his bass player, who is also his music director, um, had some heart issue. According to Keith Urban on stage, he had a little heart checky checky, he said. Um, and uh, so sometimes one of the other musicians on stage would play bass, but uh, he literally put on a bass or play bass lines on whatever they would have. Literally put on a bass. But I yeah. would say for 60 percent of the show, maybe even a little more. Um, there was, it was phantom base. Like you, you, you don't know where it came from. And then, and Keith explained it toward the end. He's like, yeah, Jerry, I think is the guy's name. Jerry flowers is the bass player. He said, yeah, he can't be here. Cause he, you know, the aforementioned heart checky checky. And he said, uh, but you know, we recorded his parts from a previous live show. So, uh, it's kind of like we have him here with us. Whoa. Yeah. And, and that, that explains some of the weirdness it was like, oh, right. So they play every show to a click. 
And so it's easy to pull, you know, uh, parts from from a previous show. But without having his music director on stage, you know, he and the, the, like the drummer was locked into him uh, in terms of starting and ending tunes. And some of the endings got a little weird. But uh, was there someone on stage taking the role of musical director? I think it, I would I would say it was the drummer, um, mm. f- you know, from that. But it was loose. It's just four of them. Yeah. Um, the band that played before, go ahead. You were going to ask a question. Was, oh, no, I was, I was just going to say, you know, direction. here's the deal. Keith is a monster guitar player is a really great player. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine that in the loose format, did he stretch it all? Did he? So, I mean, of, I guess they couldn't cause they were playing to those clicks, well, right? Well, there were a couple tunes they didn't play to a click. Um, and it was pretty clear that, you know, that was, that was happening. In fact, there was, he, uh, it was one moment, you know, Austin's full of a lot of pot smokers. It always has been. And, uh, you know, it's an outdoor gig on a warm night or whatever. And the place just <laughs> it reeked. It smelled like a fish show in there, it, which wasn't a big surprise. It, like all of Austin, it doesn't matter South by Southwest or not. You, know, you just walk down Sixth Street or whatever and it, you just smell it all the time. And uh, and Keith commented on that and started playing uh, Steve Miller's The Joker. And and so, you know, took the whole I mean, they played the whole tune and he made a comment. He said, well, given the way it smells in here, he says it either has to be this song or a Willie Nelson tune. So so they played the show and that was fine. It was fun and all that. stuff. I mean, it was a good show. Look, they're all pros. They know what to do, but it was not a highlight of the week. It was I think the I, it, you know, I saw almost 20 bands this week, maybe maybe more. I counted 20, but there might have been more. Um Every one of them except Keith Urban was just playing raw on stage, like throw your gear up as fast as you can play your 42 minutes and get off. Right. Right. And, and so there's an energy to that. Right. I mean, it's like, this is your one showcase for some bands. It's your one showcase. Some bands are smart and, and negotiate other things to do while they're in town. But you know, like this is your big shot. Like go do you and do the best you, you possibly can. So there's an energy to that. And then seeing this show that was, you know, at least at that level, scripted to a click was a little it just felt a little sterile is really what it was. Um, Mm. And, you know, I mean, I would like to see him in his element, you know, an arena show somewhere where it's his night and and all of that. We played the iTunes Festival a couple of years ago. And, and, you know, from everything I saw, it was just really really raucous. Hmm. I would not have called this Jim raucous. Yeah. 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 Our buddy Jim Dalrymple got a got a guitar from Keith that night. Yeah, he gives away a guitar. He gave away a guitar. I feel like that's like in the country rocker playbook. I saw oh. Brad Paisley. He gave away a guitar. He gave away two guitars. Oh. I, I feel like I saw somebody else, too, that gave away a guitar. It's like, what, is, is this like a thing? You too. Uh, Bono did that one time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's just weird. Like, like whatever. Fine. Cool. Get a guitar. Interesting. Great. Yeah. Um, are there... Uh, is there a trade show music trade show component of South? Are there music manuf- product manufacturers of South by? Yes, there are. Um, where, where are they and how do you find them in the convention center? There is. They, so it, this has changed several times over the years. They used to be a separate music trade show a, and a separate interactive trade show. They've now blended those together at the convention center and there's one trade show for everything. And I actually talked to the guys from uh, from Taylor there and asked them about, you know, I told them about the conversation that we had had Mm -hmm. uh, about the, uh, you know, how we thought their their electronics sort of lacked some cojones for for, you know, to to borrow a, a, a. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and the guy said, "Okay, you know, when did you come to this this decision? And I said, "Uh, I don't know, you know, sometime in the last, you know, five years, like, you know, just using this stuff. He's like, right. He said, so two years ago, we changed our electronic system in the tailors from the ES1 to the ES2. And um, the ES2 is in the saddle only. It's three piezo pickups. And it's got it was built for exactly to solve exactly this problem. It's got more beef and more. Um, but, it, you know, it's only on the newer stuff, although he said, you know, for a few hundred bucks or whatever, you can send your tailor in and they'll they'll retrofit this onto it. Yeah. So actually, so, it's funny I, I you mean, bring this up. I, you know, I don't know. But there you go. Yeah. 
Well, so here's the thing. I'm, I'm actually, I had a call into Taylor Tech Support because I'm determined to solve this problem. I love the acoustic nature of this Taylor guitar. I have a 914 CE Dave Matthews. Mm-hmm. I love the way it feels. I love the way it sounds. Just me sitting here, but plugged in, it's a freaking nightmare. Yeah. And, um, and so I've been kind of researching this for a long time. And every once in a while, I try to I bring out the guitar, see if anything has changed, you know, whether <laughs> magically while it's sitting in the case, the yes. guitar will have changed characteristics. And, you know, again, I, I am reminded how much I love the feel of the guitar. I love the looks of the guitar, the finish, the guitar, the acoustic sound of the guitar, but you plug it in and it gets really nasal and yep. really thin. It's got no, and, no uh, cojones. But, you know, as I've done research on it, I, I uh, just, some people even like the expression system one better than expression system two. Yeah. Steve, who I play acoustic music with yep. has an expression system one on a 12 string that sounds magical. So I still haven't gotten a straight answer as to whether these things are, <clears throat> are uh adjustable or configurable yeah there's one switch that's supposed to address hum that's you know part of electronics they, but they, you know yeah, they said they said <laughs> there was a thing that you can adjust like up and down with the es2 i don't know you know w- we might be able to have somebody from taylor on the show and so that That'd might be cool that would be pretty interesting yeah, yeah. well I, I would plug the guitar in and play it with him right there there you, you know? go they and, would love that i think these yeah. are, you know so so yeah so there's that kind of stuff there i i don't want to miss though some of the other bands that i saw because we talked about the big ones and uh, but they weren't the most impressive bands that I saw by, by a long shot. But, but this is actually the, the vibe of South by this is the smaller bands for showcase totally. to try and get right. Totally. So the big people are there and you know, they're kind of either doing it as a favor or they're doing it as a corporate you know right. sponsored thing or, you know, they're not there to, to, uh, to, to make fans unless the artist is in. Like, I think you told me once who was you, you told me you turned a corner and they were playing, in a parking lot or something like that. Oh, it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, Jack White, right? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Didn't you tell me that story? That. Yeah. I forgot about that. That's right. <laughs> yes. So I there is it. there the serendipitous stuff that, that, and maybe again, that might've been sponsored by sure. someone to make it look serendipitous, but I whatever. I totally forgot about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want to tell a story? No. I mean, it, like you told the story. That was it. It was like, Oh, Holy crap. Like what? Okay, cool. You know, yeah, I saw um, I didn't he didn't play, at least not to my knowledge, but I saw Justin Timberlake this year. I was just actually sitting at a food truck, like a table in front of a food truck. I'd just gotten some curry and this guy sat down who it turns out is a, a label executive from Concord Records. We had a great conversation. I actually love to get him on the show someday, too. Um, but we just, you know, we're chit chatting and he I had my back to the street and he says, is that Justin Timberlake? And I turned around and sure enough, there's Justin Timberlake just walking down the street. So, you know. By himself? uh, Well, sort of. I mean, you know, mini entourage. Yeah, because because that's how it is. Um, There was a band that you might have heard of. I had never heard of them before, but but uh, several people have called Larkin Poe. Oh man, my friend Simon and my he, in the house rockers yes, Simon, is bananas over them. Well, I can totally see why, man. So Larkin Poe is these uh, fronted by these two sisters from I think from uh, Ath- not Athens, Atlanta, maybe Georgia, somewhere in the south. Um, forgive me for getting it wrong, but um, they both play guitar. One plays a, a kind of a, a stand up lap steel thing, and then the other is just playing a regular you know electric guitar. And uh, they are, it's like, it, it, they, their originals kind of reminded me of Rush's first album in that oh. it was this very Zeppelin, like influenced riff, like heavy riff rock stuff. Like it is not what you would expect when I describe two sisters from Atlanta, right? That happened to play guitar. Um, and they had a bass player and a drummer with them. And th- I mean, this band just rocked. It was raw. It was heavy. It was bluesy. But, you know, and they played some blues covers, too. Like they they played. Um, oh, I don't remember what they played, but they, but they also played like War Pigs. They, co- they covered War Pigs because they're like, we love, you know, the Ozzy. And so we're going to do this. It's like, well, holy crap. OK. And they killed it. I mean, they, they just just killed it. And they played. They actually played right before Keith Urban. Uh, which is the only reason I saw him. I just, you know, happened to get there a little bit early because I wasn't, I thought it would get crowded and, and it wasn't, but that was okay. And then they actually sat in with Keith, Ur- Keith Urban and played a tune with him too. 
Um, but, uh, but so they're getting enough buzz where they would get that access. And you know. yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, like I said, I'd never heard of them before, but when I looked, uh, when I went to like tag them in a post on Facebook or whatever, I saw that they had 375,000 likes or so. I was like, Oh, mm. okay. All right. So they've got some, they've got some cachet. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Um, also saw another band called, it was a band of actually, again, uh, four women, you know, probably mid twenties, I would say, uh, called Heinz, H I N D S from, um, from Spain. And, and they were, they were really good. I, you know, they were just one of these bands. You kind of listen and sort of get the feel for like, th- there's buzz happening. It's like, all right, I'll go see that band. I'll go see this band. And, um, and this band was good. The place was totally packed really energetic just poppy kind of hooky riffy you know power pop uh band they they really blew me away uh how big a venue uh that was a weird venue it was like carpet on the floor i don't think it normally has bands but um maybe uh 200 people in there which is about sort of the average for um you know for for um for venues at south by southwest yeah. yep uh, I got to see a guitar player who I, I love and have seen many times. A guy named Red Volkert. Um, oh yeah. You know about He's Red classic. Volkert. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. He was he one of the really, most famous telly players. He was playing exactly. a telly, right? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've seen him many times. He lives in Austin. Uh, was actually the first legendary. Time yeah. Well, legendary, if you know who he is. Right. And then nobody else. Well, like, to, to telly players, correct. like, you know, he, He's in that kind of, you know, Danny Gatton, you know, type of lore of, of it's a plank of wood with some strings on it. And, and, Look what you can do with it. And look what you can and look what he can do with it anyway. Yeah. 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 He's it's he's an amazing guy. He's this, you know, kind of stubby round guy uh, with these like sausage fingers. I mean, like thick, short fingers. And yet I've never heard him play a missed note or a wrong note. No. Like I don't know how he does what he does. It Like it's just fascinating to watch. And he's got this gorgeous like deep baritone country kind of voice um and so they, and he's a character and he's such a character yeah he was merle haggard's right hand man for a while mm. um but yeah really fun like if you ever get a chance to see i always i went out of my way to see red on this trip um i actually drove in my car to a venue it was a south by southwest gig but um but it was sort of off the beaten path sort of and uh so anyway so i got to see red and uh, I'm trying to think if there was there was any other bands that really I'm looking at my list here. Um, yeah, there was one band called it was a band from. Well, there's a band from Austin. I think we were told about them on this ep, on this show when Mark Linsenmeyer came on a band called Roxy Roca, which is an Austin band. He and I have a mutual. Well, uh, there's a guy that was in that band that was a mutual friend of, of ours, which is why Mark had brought him up. But um, they they're an original band playing kind of tunes like your band. And they've written these originals to sound like, you know, older, like funk, uh, you know, soul tunes. And they've got two horn players. They, they used to have a guitar and a keyboard. Now that's just two guitars and the, both guitar players are killer. And then bass and drums. And the weird part was I didn't have them on my list. I was standing at the Keith Urban show the night before. And, you know, started talking to the guy next to me and he's like, yeah, I'm from Austin, but I play in a band and we have our showcase and it's tomorrow night. And I'm like, oh, what's the name of the band? And he tells me, and I'm like, okay. And then I get to the thing. I'm like, wait, I know the name of this band. We've been told about <laughs> it before. And, uh, and they were great. I mean, and, and, and their songs are good. Their singer, like energetic and you could just have fun watching them. It was, they were a really fun band. So that's cool. Uh, so that was Excellent. good. Yeah. 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 Um, I also, it, well, before we move on, I do want to say, and this blows me away every year that I've gone, and it's been five years since I've been, the sound at every venue was stellar. Mm. I, I mean, you know, like never once did I hear feedback, never once. But this I, is, there's not a consistency. Each venue is responsible for their own sounds, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or every corporate event. No, no, no. When when they're South by Southwest events, they like the like a lot of these clubs have bands all the time, but it's not necessarily the house sound person. It is South Uh, by Southwest sound 
and South by Southwest brought in gear. Like every one of these mixers was a top. So this goes notch. back to the, the the core mission of South by, which is as a music festival. And I guess yeah. that makes sense that it's not just about, you know, you know, placing bands and venues. It's more about the experience that people can have. So yeah. I, I'm really that's really cool to hear because that's a lot of expense and a lot of it's, work to get. Oh, I mean, like they had. Yeah, they, these were, you know, top end digital mixers in every venue and uh, all mostly QSC gear that clearly in a lot of these venues was is not there normally. Right. Y you know, it was so likely in. some deal with QSC yeah. to, to make that happen. Like they rented gear. They, they The mixers were all different brands, which is interesting. But, you know, they were all high end uh, stuff. It was it, I mean, and again, the sound was like I never once strained to hear vocals. The mixes were always I mean, sometimes somebody would miss a guitar solo at, at the start or whatever. I mean, you know, you got to remember these sound guys have no idea right. what's going to happen, you know, when this band takes the stage. But even that was, you know, these guys were all pros. And so the, it, you know, the problem would have been, would be solved within four seconds or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then you hear it really, really impressive. And a lot of these rooms are not forgiving rooms. It, it, you know, they're, they're, they're hole in the wall clubs. And, and yet, yeah. you know, these guys get there and tune it out and they're, they're it. all day. They're burned out. Like I've talked, I've actually not this year, but um, in the past, I, I watched the sound guy fall asleep at the soundboard and I, I nudged him <laughs> like, Hey man, he's like, Oh Dude. yeah, sorry. <laughs> He's like, you know how long I was like, you don't have to apologize to me. I'm never going to tell anybody about this. I OK, so I do. But, uh, you know, like, it's OK. He was like, yeah, thanks, man. OK. Like, can I go to the bar and get you a Coke or something? He's like, uh, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. Um, and the time funny. and the timing was on point. Uh, it, you know, all of these bands are playing. They've got, you know, at. The, the the lowest number of bands that they'd have at a club is five in a night. And everybody's, you know, uh, starts at the top of the hour, generally plays for 40 minutes. And then the next band starts at the top of the hour. And these changeovers happened, uh, uh, you know, quickly. I would get to a club at, you know, 950 for a 10 p.m. showcase from somebody or whatever. And the showcase would start right at 10 p.m. I mean, it was just really impressive. And some clubs have. Two stages, like a lot of places in Austin, because it's, you know, outdoor venues work. Um, they'll have an indoor stage and an outdoor stage. And that's really great because you can just go back and forth. Well, mm -hmm. as soon as one band stops, you go inside and the other one's just starting up. So it's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I mentioned that it was a film festival, right? I want to talk about <laughs> the uh, the films because I saw two films that were very applicable to our audience here. But the first thing that I want to do before that is I want to talk about our sponsor, Tune Licensing, if that's okay with you, Mr. King. Please do it. Yeah, man. So TuneLicensing.com is built if you are covering a song and you want to release it in any form. You want to release it. You need to get the rights to this. Otherwise, if you get any exposure or play of that song at all, you are going to have a legal problem. And let me tell you this. You don't want legal problems. I can speak from experience. They will get into every aspect of your life and you just don't want this. So you want to be able to make money covering the songs that you love. You want to gain some exposure and you want to do it knowing that all your bases are covered, but you're not a lawyer. Good news. The people at TuneLicensing.com are, they understand everything all of the aspects of how royalties work. And in addition to that, they have all the contacts in the industry so they can get in touch with the right people to get this done for you in the way that it needs to be. So and it's easy and it's easy. They, they make it right? easy. They, well, it's not easy. They make it easy because they, they make the it easy. work. Yep, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what you do is you go to tunelicensing.com. They have a database of all these tunes, but if the tune happens to be not in the database, that's fine. Tell them about it. They'll go figure it out. They'll dig it up. They'll do whatever they need to do. They'll contact all the right people. They'll get all the right contracts in place. They'll cross all the T's. They'll dot all the I's. And then they'll tell you, all right, you're good to go. Go. And then you can release with knowing that everything's covered and you're not going to run into any problems. And here's the best part. You get to save a little bit of money doing it because you're a listener. When you're checking out, use coupon code GIGGAB2018, G-I-G-G-A-B-2018. 
you save 15% off of their licensing fee. It's a pretty cool thing. Good deal. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Please go check them out. Tunelicensing.com. Yeah. Our thanks. I would just say that, yeah, yeah, I, oh, yeah. we love having them as a sponsor. And I, my thought every time we, we, we talk about them is as musicians, we are, uh, we trade in karma, right? That's what we put. Yes. We put good things out into the world. And sure. if someone's written a song that you like well enough to actually re-record it and put it out there again, you want them to be taken care of for giving you the gift of that great song. And this is the easiest fastest most efficient and uh, and coolest way that you can make sure that that uh, everything is on the up and up when you release a song with someone else's written so do go. it sweet thanks so much to tunelicensing.com again gig gab 2018 saves you 15 percent. all right cool. all yep so I saw, I saw two movies um the first one that i saw is about a performer that not everybody knows about a guy named uh, well we call him here Ruben Blades. Do you know who Ruben Blades is, Paul? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. He's a percussionist. Well, no, he's a singer, a songwriter, and a politician and a Harvard graduate and lots of other things too, but no, I, I didn't I mean I I don't know if he was a percussionist, was he? I don't know. I, I, that didn't come up in the movie. I'm, yeah. You keep talking and, and okay. I will and I will check it out. You'll check him out. Yeah. So he um he huge, huge recording artist down in Latin America. He sings right. sings all of his songs in Spanish, which is why a lot of people in the US don't know about him. But uh but again, you know, he's really he's a worldwide sensation is who this guy is. And he's a really private guy. But um but he was convinced to tell his story because a smart filmmaker went up to him and said, you can tell it or after you die, somebody else is going to tell it for you. And, and he, like I said, he's a really interesting guy. He had a lot of success, uh, obviously, with his um, with his recording career and his, his performing career. Uh, his first gig in the U.S., uh, he came here, he auditioned for a band and played, got the gig, uh, played. His first gig was at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Great singer, this guy, uh, but very shy guy. In fact, he wanted to play his first gig at Madison Square Garden with a mask. And the, the band leader said no. Um, but uh, but then he went back. He's from Panama. He went back to Panama. He actually ran for president of Panama. He didn't make it, but he was director of tourism for five years. And then uh, then he went on to um, he's he's done. uh He's done movies. I mean, it's just it's one of these people that's just done a ton of things and really interesting guy. And uh, and he was there when the movie showed because I, I happened to see the first showing of it. So that made it the premiere, the premiere. And he answered some questions, you know, from the crowd or whatever. But a really interesting movie. Here's the frustrating thing about any movies I'm about to mention to you. This is a film festival, which means that movies are there to get exposure and then hopefully get picked up and get distributed. So you can't go see this movie yet, which is frustrating. But it's called Ruben Blades is not my name, or at least that's the working title right now. Um, so I, I knew I, his I, reputation from you know, the Afro Cuban music scene. So that's why I assumed he was a percussionist. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It was really and watching that movie, like how much he talked about how early on his dad explain to him the importance of the clave rhythm you know that <laughs> right that whole yep. thing and uh and and it was really fascinating watching him on stage even while he's like walking around and singing like with one of his hands he's just kind of making that rhythm of course somebody on stage is is making it too you know and it's it's the basis of so many of those those songs and styles but just seeing him effortlessly like tapping his fingers or his, his toes or whatever to that rhythm mm. like you and I would tap him. to one, one, two, three, four, right? I mean, here's yeah. this syncopated thing that's not natural, at least un, until you make it natural. And then it's just there. Yeah. So it was that part of it as a musician was like, dude, how do you do that? And the way you do it is you do it for decades. You know, you make it part of your, your soul is what it is. Absolutely. So Eight Grammy Awards, five Latin Grammy Awards. Okay, there you go. Three Emmy nominations, and he he uh, is stars in Fear the Walking Dead now. So that's actually pretty cool. Oh, uh, I didn't realize that. Oh, it's fascinating. Fast. So he was a fascinating guy. I saw a movie called If I Leave Here Tomorrow. It was a film about Leonard Skinner. Um, that mm -hmm. it was a documentary about the band. Um, I really hope this one makes it out. I think it will. Uh, I think b both of these will uh, he, th that band 
It was really so. First of all, the name it happened to be that their their gym teacher's name was Leonard Skinner, mm-hmm. but that's not where the name of the band came from. For whatever reason, like any time th- there was just this thing that any time you heard like a noise that you couldn't explain or whatever, it was like, oh, it's Leonard Skinner. You know, like that was what people would say. And it was just sort of a joke. And when they were coming up with names of the band, they were like throwing things out, throwing things out. And they, they had some names that were awful. And one of the guys finally said, it's Leonard Skinner. And <laughs> and the rest of the guys said, where? What'd you hear? Like, they didn't know what he was saying. They didn't realize he was suggesting that as the name of the band. They thought he was just cutting it up. And uh, sure enough, that's where the name of them. So it's, it was a major inside joke. But these guys... Like they had this shack in the woods that they rehearsed in and they 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 each had to take turns sleeping there because people would, you know, rob it and steal all their gear. Uh, but And it was awful. They said the nights that you had to spend in the shack were terrible. But those guys, even when they went in to record their first album, they were so rehearsed, like the only place that they would ever improvise was in their own like rehearsal studio, wow. all the guitar parts, every, like the solos, everything, even when they showed up to record their first album, the engineer was saying it was like a dream. They came in and they knew the songs perfectly. Like there was no, not only did they not have to think about it, there was no discussion, no debate. It was just like, yeah, here's our song. So, you know, Hey man, roll the tape. Like we'll play it. Great. That's cool. amazing. Now roll the tape again. Yeah. You don't, I don't, I never thought of them as that kind of a band where they were never. Just no, absolutely. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, you, you would not think of them as being meticulous either. I mean, right. you, I, I always think of them being highly produced. I mean, if you, if you think about the guitar solo in Freebird and the trade-offs of the different guitar solos, right. Yeah. And how, how absolutely magically they dovetail into each other. It's really a, like a, it's a mystical thing, man. Right. Yep. I always thought that that was, uh, you know, some producer walking yep, yep. into a studio line by magic line. or whatever. Right. Yeah. Well, it was, except it was in their rehearsal room by themselves. They figured it out. Amazing. And, you know, I mean, it, to, to say that there was no producer. I mean, I don't, I'm sure they did have a producer, but but, you know, like they crafted that. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's cool. Pretty amazing. And so same thing. We don't know if that if that uh, film will make the light of day, but um, you're saying if it does go see. see? Yep. And and then there's actually one last one that that I didn't put on my list to prep, but um, it's a movie called Heavy Trip. It is made by two, I think, Finnish. I want to say Finnish, if not Norwegian, Scandinavian filmmakers that have never made a movie before. It's 98% subtitles in, you know, so that you can understand the English. And it's kind of like, uh, it's about a, a, a Finnish heavy metal band that uh, from a, you know, tiny little town that wants to go and play at this, um, huge, you know, metal festival in, uh, in Norway. And, and so it, it's a comedy it's it's kind of like the Blues Brothers with a little bit of Spinal Tap mixed in, but way more of a story than Spinal Tap. It's you know, it's it's more like the Blues Brothers and hysterical Is it like Anvil. I've never seen Anvil, hmm. so I can't speak to that. But it was it was hysterical and amazing that the jokes and the humor worked, you know, across the language barrier. It was just brilliant, really, truly brilliant. So. Uh, and I think that one's going to get picked up. So if you if you get a chance, definitely go see it. It's um, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, yeah. there's actually a you know a, a fair body of work uh, of heavy metal band documentaries such out there now. I yeah, think well, this was a mockumentary, you know, right? It's not. Oh, got it. it, got it, got it this it. was this was not a real band, like it, not at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was it was fake. Yeah, and funny, really funny. <laughs> Yeah. So that's the thing is it, you should go back and see the story of Anvil. Back, okay. I think it was like 2008. And again, it was a, a, a band that was on the cusp of heavy metal stardom. And then, and then it didn't happen. And, it. you know, the characters are really interesting. All so, right. and they're, you know, they're playing, they're playing really, really small venues, metal, you know, yeah. full martial stacks. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just trying right. to keep alive. So that huh. was, that was one of my favorites. Oh, cool. All right. All right. There you go. All right. So, yeah. So, you know, like that's and that's to me, the beauty of of South by Southwest is that you get these 
this convergence of things, right? Like there's, there's the music festival, but then because there's also a film festival, you get to see these things. And I think I mentioned in the, in the last episode that, you know, there was things like sound city showed there. And then there was a gig where there was sound city, you, you know, on stage with the Foo Fighter, Dave Grohl and his band playing with, you know, Fogarty and, and uh, uh, Rick Nielsen. And like, uh, you know, it was just like a thing. And they, they did some of that. There was a movie called blaze that he, Ethan Hawke had put together about Blaze Foley, and then they did a show. I didn't. I didn't go see the movie or the show. It was just you know, it's too much going on. But um, but it is cool when it all kind of converges together, and you know, you sort of the lines get very very blurred between <clears throat> what festivals exist. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah. 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 All right, man. So I want to end today. I just want to walk back something that I've said a few times on the show over the okay. last couple of years. So no, nope. I mean you're going to be surprised about this. So. I've been playing my solo acoustic stuff and, and for some reason, some of this seventies classic rock and classic, no, actually not so much the classic country and certainly some of the seventies pop stuff that I do. Yeah. It's just starting to feel a little dated all of a sudden, which is, you know, kind of like the cycles I go through with these, these songs sure. is that, you know, they're always there. You rediscover them and you love them. Then you play them a lot. And then you remember that you grew tired of them and you, know, you need to you put it back old. on the shelf for a yeah, while. Of course. Yeah. <clears throat> so believe it or not, where I've been getting most of my inspiration from lately is I've been revisiting nineties bands. Uh Oh, I've been so critical of nineties music. <clears throat> and I should say that again, I still think that the difference is, is that sixties and seventies music had a place in popular culture that was different, right? Sure. Much different than how the music industry matured and, and, you know, moved on and certainly how music was consumed is different in the nineties, two thousands today than it sure. was in the sixties, seventies and early eighties. Yep. But anyway, I, what I'm going to say is I'm having a great time. I'm mostly centered on four bands. Okay. Oasis. Yeah. Counting Crows. Oh, interesting. Okay. Matchbox 20. Yep. And Dave Matthews. Huh. And the Dave Matthews stuff, we should do a show on Dave Matthews because it seems to be one of the more controversial things that people really throw a lot of hate at Dave Matthews stuff. As a guitar yeah. player, yeah. that is really, really fun stuff to play. I mean, it is just a very different way of looking at chord oh, formations he, and he, rhythm. And so, it is so, so fun. He plays the guitar like Stevie Wonder plays the piano. It's a yeah. it's a different approach to the instrument i i and he sings over it <laughs> that's the thing is playing something like satellite and singing over it it's uh, like you come screw on, man. you man that's right yep but I it's know. really fun to try and do i actually you know you, you you can get far enough along where you can kind of get there and you can kind of yeah. see what he's doing and you know just because there is consistency once you kind of dig into his approach to the guitar sure but i would like to say that for the hate that i've thrown on 90s music over the years doing this show I'm really enjoying the freshness. I'm enjoying the poetry, especially the Counting Crows stuff. The, yeah. the Dave Matthews stuff is more about the guitar for me, but the Crows stuff and the, the Matchbox 20 stuff, is they're just great pop songs. They are oh, just definitely. really yeah. so well-constructed pop songs. And then the Counting Crows stuff is, you know, and, and that Oasis is kind of a hybrid of all this stuff. Great pop songs, you know, great rock songs, great melodies, really fun to play. And then the Crows stuff is kind of that kind of moody connection. I have, I have them doing a couple of Radiohead songs as well. Okay. Yeah. That's fun to reinterpret, but um, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I'm going to walk back that the music is going to be eternal and that it's going to have the same, um, same uh, emotional lasting power as, you know, Motown stuff or, you know, the, the early classic rock stuff, but I, I am digging into it now. I'm going to actually do a show that's going to be about half, ha all this new stuff. It will make up about a half a show for me. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do over the next couple of weeks and I, I just kind of want to report back about it, but mostly it's no, the reflection so about no, this newness, right? No this, this freshness. Stuff? No, well, we have to remember the 90s stuff is 20 years old already, but, um, yep. It, yep. At 20 plus, right? <laughs> I was going to say 20 plus. Cause really like I consider REM a nineties band, you know, more than they were in the eighties, even though they certainly their time was started in the eighties, but, but they were, you know, they were a band like, like, like we categorize things as the nineties. So no REM so, stuff for you. Um, uh, let's pause right there. So, um, <laughs> so you got me fully into REM when you and I started playing yeah. music together and hanging yeah. out together. You know, you brought a couple in and I, you know, they, REM was just this kind of outlier, you know, 
you know, alternative sound, right? Sure. But then you got me into it, and I could do nothing but listen to REM for quite a while. So that same um, thing happened to me probably, you know, 14 years prior to me making that happen for you. So just so you know, I, I right. feel you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you know, dedicated to the one I love, good, you know, man on the moon, good. Yeah. You know, I haven't actually, but now that you, <laughs> you just did it to me again, man. So, <laughs> so I'm going to have to go have to back and, and add some of these things in yeah. my favorite REM song is electrolyte. I mean, I just, uh. that, that melody just haunts me, but it's, I, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about if we can, cause that's a piano song. I'd yeah. have to think about how that would translate. So that's, guitar. that could be. We're, you're, we're, you're definitely talking about like the nineties REM stuff there, right? Because there's a whole catalog of, of things that, that, you know, like the early REM stuff that, that, that you know, from the eighties, like, yeah. I mean, I consider life switch pageant, the newer of those albums, right. Yeah. But, you know, with things like pilgrimage and boxcars, um, like there's just some great, great songs, uh, fall on me. Holy That's crap. a great one. That's Holy beautiful. Crap. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. How did they make that song? Like <laughs> <laughs> who thinks it, of this stuff? for anybody that cares. And this only started happening a couple of days ago. Um, Mike Mills uh, from R.E.M., their bass player, uh, he uh, he's on Twitter. He's been on Twitter for a long time. But for whatever reason, he started uh, answering people's questions about R.E.M. stuff, which if you're an R.E.M. fan is really sort of an interesting thing because they 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 preserved a mystique about a lot of things with their band wisely. Like it served them well to have lyrics that were unintelligible and, and, you know, like, so there's all kinds of questions that he's just been answering pretty honestly on Twitter. I mean, there's some cheeky answers that are like, okay, cool. Like he's still keeping the mystery alive. Like, great. But you know, the band is defunct now they've retired. So like some of these things he's pretty, you know, he's just pretty honest about coming out. So mm. if you're an REM fan, it, I spent about a half hour last night, just ro- scrolling back through his, uh, his Twitter feed. He's M underscore Millsy, M I L L L C S E Y uh, on Twitter. And I'll put a link in the show notes, but if you're, if you're an REM fan, it's like, it, it won't take much. You, you'll have to, I, I will warn you whether you like him or hate him. Uh, you will have to weed through all of Mike's rants about Donald Trump. But, um, but you, you know, if you're just into it for the music, you can ignore that stuff and just scroll past it and see the cool little questions that he's answered. Cause it's freaking awesome. <laughs> When I think of REM, the main thing I think of is someday being able to do Begin the Begin and Bad Day with you. <laughs> we played Begin the Begin once. Uh, Rehearsal only, right? No, we played it at the park, uh, which was, I think, Cirque du Mac gig number two, if if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we played it at the park. Um, it was the one Cirque du Mac that, that Bill Tasto ran sound for us. <laughs> so yeah, I, right. but we 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 could do it better than we did. I'll just say that. I mean, you know, we, love like, those songs. It's oh, love yeah. those songs. Yeah, so fun. Yeah, so fun. Yep, very cool. All right, well, there we are. Uh, an hour later, yay nineties. Uh, yay nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So cool stuff. I uh, am very happy. I went back to South by Southwest after five years of not having gone. It was it was it, it wasn't an intentional thing. It was just you know scheduling and all that. So. Yeah, very glad cool you stuff. got your voice back. Yeah, I am too. It it survived the whole show, which is uh, good because now I only have one more show to record today. So, all right, <laughs> good stuff. We have anything else? Is that it? Are we good? Good one. Good. No, welcome cool. back. Thanks, man. Yep. Thanks everybody for uh, for doing what you do. Thanks to TuneLicensing.com again. Coupon code GigGab two zero one eight saves you fifteen percent. Thanks to everybody that listens. Thanks for all your great comments on our Facebook group, giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. It's fun stuff. What do you have to say, Paul? Always be performing. I'll do it.